the loving and the serving of God, and trusting in His mercy in the time of our correction and misery, is the truest note of a sincere child and servant of the Lord. Number 6. Sanctified affliction is a singular help to further our true conversion, and to drive us home by repentance to our Heavenly Father. In their affliction, says the Lord, they will seek me diligently. Egypt's burdens made Israel cry unto God. David's troubles made him pray. Hezekiah's sickness made him weep, and misery drove the prodigal child to return and plead for his father's grace and mercy. Yes, we read of many in the gospel that by sicknesses and afflictions were driven to come unto Christ, who, if they had had health and prosperity as others, would have, like others, neglected or despised their Savior, and never have sought unto him for his saving health and grace. For, as the ark of Noah, the higher it was tossed with the flood, the nearer it mounted towards heaven. So the sanctified soul, the more it is exercised with affliction, the nearer it is lifted towards God. O oh, blessed is that cross which draws a sinner to come upon the knees of his heart unto Christ, to confess his own misery, and to implore his endless mercy. O oh, blessed, ever blessed be that Christ that never refuses the sinner that comes unto him, though whether driven by affliction and misery. Number 7. Affliction works in us pity and compassion toward our fellow brethren that are in distress and misery, whereby we learn to have a fellow feeling of their calamities, and to condole their estate as if we suffered with them. And for this cause Christ himself would suffer, and be tempted in all things like unto us, sin being the exception, that he might be a merciful high priest, touched with the feeling of our infirmities. For none can so heartily bemoan the misery of another as he who first himself suffered the same affliction. Number 8. God uses our sicknesses and afflictions as means and examples, both to manifest to others the faith and virtues which he has bestowed upon us, as also to strengthen those who have not received so great a measure of faith as we. For there can be no greater encouragement to a weak Christian than to behold a true Christian in the extreme sickness of his body, being supported with greater patience and consolation in his soul. And the comfortable and blessed departure of such a man will arm him against the fear of death, and assure him that the hope of the godly is a far more precious thing than that flesh and blood can understand, or mortal eye behold, in this valley of misery. And were it not that we did see many of those whom we know to be the undoubted children of God, to have endured such afflictions and calamities before us, the greatness of the miseries and crosses which oft-times we endure would make us doubt whether we are the children of God or not. And to this purpose James says, God made Job and the prophets an example in suffering adversity. Number 9. By afflictions God makes us conformable to the image of Christ his Son, who, being the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through sufferings. And therefore he first bore the cross in shame before he was crowned with glory, did first take gall, before he did eat of the honeycomb, and was derided king of the Jews by the soldiers in the high priest's hall, before he was saluted king of glory by the angels in his father's court. And the more lively our heavenly father shall perceive the image of his natural son to appear in us, the better he will love us. And when we have for a time borne his likeness in his sufferings, and fought and overcome, we shall be crowned by Christ, and with Christ sit on his throne, and from Christ receive the precious white stone and morning star, that shall make us shine like Christ forever in his glory. Number 10. And lastly, that the godly man may be humbled in respect of their own state and misery, 
and God glorified by delivering them out of their troubles and afflictions when they call upon him for his help and support. For though there be no man so pure, but if the Lord will straightly mark iniquities, he shall find in him just cause to punish him for his sin, yet the Lord in mercy does not always in the affliction of his children do it because of their sins, but sometimes lays afflictions and crosses upon them for his own glory's sake. Thus our Saviour Christ told his disciples that the man was not born blind for his own or his parents' sin, but that the work of God should be showed on him. So he told them likewise that Lazarus's sickness was not unto death, but for the glory of God. O oh, the unspeakable goodness of God, which turns those afflictions, which are the shame and punishment due to our sins, to be the subject of His honor and glory. These are the blessed and profitable ends for which God sends sickness and affliction upon His children, whereby it may plainly appear that afflictions are not signs either of God's hatred or our reprobation, but rather tokens and pledges of His fatherly love unto children whom He loves, and therefore chastens them in this life where upon repentance there remains hope of pardon, rather than to refer the punishment to that life where there is no hope of pardon, nor end of punishment. For this cause the Christians in the primitive church were accustomed to give God great thanks for afflicting them in this life. So the apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's name and the Christian Hebrews suffered with joy the confiscation of their goods, knowing that they had in heaven a better and an enduring substance. And in respect of those holy ends, the Apostle says that though no affliction for the present seems joyous but grievous, yet afterwards it brings the quiet fruit of righteousness to them who are exercised thereby. Pray, therefore, heartily, that as God has sent you this sickness, so it would please him to come himself unto you with your sickness, by teaching you to make those sanctified uses of it for which he has inflicted the sickness upon you.